Um, we riders, we want to show that we're a multi-generational church, so we want kids to ride, the not so much kids anymore to ride. Um, and so we just need people to help coordinate those things. If it's just Denny and I here, it's not going to work, and we don't want it to be hours and days for any one person. So if you would be interested in helping out at all, come Wednesday night at 7, or see me, and hopefully we can um, pull this together. Thanks. Are there any other announcements? I would like to invite uh, anybody that would like to come. Um, this evening at 6 o'clock here at the church, uh, we're doing our continuing study on the covenant of God uh, with his uh, sons and daughters. If you'll all uh, join me in the passing of peace. And now, if you will all, please be seated and uh, let us prepare our hearts and minds for our worship this morning. Thank you.
Please be seated. Well, good morning. For those of you who do not know, I'm Pastor Tom, and it's my pleasure to be here once again with the good people of Hebrew and United Methodist Church. Now, one of the ushers came up to me and said, you know what, there are no joys and concerns this morning. And I thought, well, you know what, there's a great joy any time people are gathered to celebrate God. Think about that, that we are gathered today to talk to, to celebrate, to grow in the knowledge of the Creator God, the God who spoke through the prophets, the Redeemer God, and the God who is present in everyone's life. That very God has called you here this morning. And sometimes we need to stop and reflect on the fact that God is the author of true joy. The author of true joy. And when we raise our concerns, and we do have a, a prayer request, we raise our concerns to God. We know that God, through Jesus Christ, has experienced everything that we could possibly experience in our lives. A God who knows our fear, who knows our suffering, who knows our doubts, and a God whose grace is ever abundant. And so let us now raise our joy to the Lord in prayer as we say, O oh, Holy God, we lift up to you rejoicing that you are a God of abundant grace and unending mercy. We rejoice in the joy of family. We pray that our families may show the love as you continually show for your people. We rejoice in the joy of the Church of Jesus Christ of which we are members. We rejoice in the joy that we can gather as a people and praise your holy name, and praise the holy name of your Son, our Redeemer. And today, Father, we come to you too with those things that are on our heart, and we, we want to pray especially this morning for Linda Maiden, and Father, we just rejoice, because after developing blood clots in her lungs, she seems to be doing better, and we just rejoice and continue to pray that your healing power will surround her and strengthen her. And we rejoice that Kathy has brought her forward for prayer this morning. And we also rejoice that as we speak today, a group of individuals from this church is on their way to a mission trip. And Father, we just pray for your protection upon them. May they journey safely, and by the guidance of your Holy Spirit, may they be led just to glorify your name in the work that they do. And we also pray for those things now that reside only in the hearts and minds of those gathered here this morning. We lift them up to you, Father. Where there is fear, grant hope. Where there is despair, comfort. Where there is suffering, healing. And where there is darkness, light. And we pray all of this in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
you can, reach out and take the hand of the person next to you. As we are united in community, we stand before a holy God and we pray. Holy God of grace and glory, we know that through your Son you gave birth to your church, and we rejoice that we today are called to be the church of Jesus Christ. We know that through your prophets and in your holy word you spoke your truth. Strengthen us today so that we may proclaim that truth and reveal your kingdom to a world of darkness. And in the glorious resurrection of your Son, you exalted him as Lord of the heavens and the earth, and we pray that we may be able and diligent and compassionate followers. And as we continue to be of our worship today, we pray that through the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, we will hunger to know more of your word. We will hunger to grow in the knowledge of your Son. And we will be strengthened to walk from this place to be the church of Jesus Christ as disciples and making disciples for the transformation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.
Please join me in the prayer of dedication. O oh God, of the universe, with the Holy Spirit within us, we pour out our gifts in your presence. Take us and use us as you see fit. We're speaking in the sense of your righteousness. We offer our voices to proclaim your will. Where our efforts can free others from bondage, we offer our strength. perspective here, I have to let you know that this family, the Weaver family, just got back from vacation yeah. from an Alaskan cruise, got home at yeah. 10 o'clock last night. Yeah. So I'm amazed that these kids were still willing to do this, and they're just their musicianship and their faith and their spirit. So thank, thanks to the kids for doing this.
chapter 9, verse 11 through 15. In that day, I will restore David's fallen shelter. I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins and will rebuild it as it used to be so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. And I will bring my people Israel back from exile. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land. Never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. The word of the Holy Scripture for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning again. It really is a pleasure to be here in Hebron. Now, you know, I, I've spoken here, I've preached here before, and I apparently must have done a pretty good job because it only took a year for me to be invited back. <laughs> but seriously, I'm very, very pleased to be here. I just spent the last three days at the annual conference of the Indiana United Methodist Church with, with Pastor Pete. And Pastor Pete said, now when you preach, please don't tell any embarrassing stories about me. We've known each other for a long time, so please don't reveal any of those things that, that have happened to us. And I said, Pastor Pete, if I do that, my whole sermon's gone. I have nothing to talk about. But seriously, what I want to talk to you about today is the prophet Amos. Now you may not be totally familiar with the prophet Amos. He's referred to as one of the minor prophets. But in no way are his words minor or less important. So let me give you a little background and then talk a little bit about how Amos is speaking to us today, right here in the Hebron United Methodist Church, and in the church I serve, Church of Four Seasons, and in every church every congregation of the Church of Jesus Christ. Now, Amos was not a professional prophet. Amos was, by his own admission, a lowly shepherd, a tender of flocks, and he was what they call a dresser of sycamore trees. He took care of trees. And at this time, Israel was divided. There was a northern kingdom known as Israel, the southern kingdom known as Judah. And here we have this simple herdsman, an arborist, is called from his very ordinary life to do an extraordinary thing. He was called to go to the northern kingdom of Israel and offer to them a warning. Now, why did that happen? Because at this time, Israel was experiencing peace and prosperity. They were doing really well. They were not under attack by any other nation. The economy was booming, if you want to use contemporary terms. So they were really living the good life. Really enjoying life to its fullest. <coughs> but something was wrong. Something was very, very wrong. Because the Israelites had made God way too small. Oh, they still would have their ritual observances and they'd do their sacrificial offerings, but God was very small. They put God in a corner. And they thought simply by going through the motions of being the people of God, they were doing what God wanted. And obviously they thought it was working because they were so richly blessed. 
They were so blessed by what was happening in their economy. They were so blessed by what was happening in the way that suddenly they were being protected from their enemies. And so here comes Amos, this ordinary man, and he gives them a very stern message. He said, you know, God is not happy with Israel. And if you read the entire book of Amos, you see that most of that book is Amos talking about what's going wrong among the people. And talking about what God can do to them in judgment. All of these things that can happen, they can be invaded by foreign people. They can have plagues of locusts. They can be consumed by fire. All of these things. And what was Amos complaining about? Amos was complaining about the fact that as they made God too small, they made their worldview too narrow. They didn't care for the poor. In fact, they exploited the poor. The rich got richer and the poor got poorer. They took advantage of the widows and the orphans. They were not a people of God's justice. They were not a people following God's will. And so they made their world very narrow. Only the wealthy, only the upper class, only the powerful. But then in the, in the scripture that we heard this morning, Amos offers some good news. Good news that says God will forgive you if you repent. God will call you into his mercy if you turn to God. God will rebuild from the remnant of Israel his people. But to make that happen, you have to be willing to make God as big as God really is. And I think sometimes we today make God too small. We segregate God to a sanctuary. We put God in the box we want God to be in. And that's what the Israelites were doing. And when we make God too small, then we too develop this very narrow view of the world. This world of insiders and outsiders. This world where injustice is tolerated and abided. Where human suffering, sometimes we become numb to it. For we never realize that we are called to serve a very big God. And that's what Amos was saying to Israel. And that is what Amos is saying to us today. So let's stop and think a little bit about how Amos relates to what's happening right now. All across this world every corner of the world. What's happening right now is very ordinary people are being called by God to do extraordinary things. All of you. All of you. We are all ordinary people. But our calling, whether we are pastors or members of a congregation or part of a mission committee, we are called to do extraordinary things. And that's why we say that finally some good news. But here's the interesting part of all this. We are called to be the bearers of that good news. That's what Amos was. He was bringing good news of God's grace. We are called to be the bearers of good news. 
That's why we're here. That's why we've been called here. That's why we are part of the Hebrew United Methodist Church. That's why we're part of the Church of Jesus Christ. So what exactly is the good news? Now, when the prophet Amos spoke, this was centuries before the birth of Christ, but he was still bringing the good news of God's grace and God's mercy and God's forgiveness. And he was telling people that if you are going to accept this good news, you have to share it. And if you are going to accept that good news, you have to be willing to live that good news. That was the message. And that is the message we still hear today. We are bearers of the good news. Think about that. No matter how old or how young, no matter where we are in our stage of life, we are called to bear the good news of God's grace. We are called to live as people of the good news of God's grace. And what does that mean? It means we cannot make our worldview too narrow. This conference that Pastor Pete and I just attended, the theme of the conference was see all the people. And that's what we are called to do. We are called to see all the people, all the time. The message of Amos was a message of God's grace. And when God's grace is lived in the world, you know what that is? That's justice. That's peace. That's love. That's what we are called to do. Ordinary people called to carry that good news to everyone we meet. And you may say, well, we, you know, we, we may only have uh, so many people in our congregation and we may be worried about this or worried about that, but the reality is your mission field is right here. Maybe your mission field is your neighbor. Maybe your mission field is a co-worker. Maybe your mission field is someone who you know is broken, someone you know is hurting, someone you know who is looking for hope in the midst of despair. Just as Amos traveled from Judah to Israel, you are called to travel from where you are to someone hurting, to someone questioning, to someone in need. And you know, it's interesting because what it means that as the Church of Jesus Christ, we are called to reveal the kingdom of God. We are called to be a people of justice. We're called to be a people of hope. We are called to be a people of love. And that really is the message that Amos was telling the Israelites. And it doesn't mean that all of a sudden material blessings will flow from the heavens. But it means that the world can be transformed one life at a time by very ordinary people called to do very extraordinary things. And so I would challenge you this morning to think about that fact. Think about someone you know who needs to experience God's grace. And you all know someone. Think about someone you know who needs to experience forgiveness. And think about someone you know who needs to experience hope. You are called by God to be an instrument 
of those things to that person. One person. Mommy. One life. And you see, sometimes we forget that we are not simply called to come together as a church. We are called to be the church in the world. And it's not difficult. But we have to start by asking ourselves if we have really experienced the good news of Jesus Christ. And that was a hard thing for me because I had to take a long, hard look at who I was and what my life was like so I could experience Jesus Christ. Because once you experience Jesus Christ in your life, then you can do nothing but share that. Share it not by simply knocking on a door saying, if you die tomorrow, you know where you're going. But by building relationships. That's what Amos was telling the Israelites. Building relationships with those the world might call different. Building relationships with those the world might call unlovable. Building relationships with those who are rejected. That's called bearing the good news. And although it seems the Israelites did not totally understand what Amos was saying, his message has come down through the ages. His message was fulfilled for us in Jesus Christ. The example of how to bear the good news, the good news himself. And that is what we are asked to do. That is who we are asked to be. And so, in closing, I would simply challenge you this way. I challenge you within the next week to spend some time alone with God. You don't have to give a lengthy verbose prayer. Just open your heart to the presence of God. And as you open your heart to the presence of God, ask yourself, who do I carry Christ to this week? And you might be surprised at the answer. And as you open yourself to the presence of God, I ask you to consider what do I have to do to grow in my knowledge of Christ? And it doesn't necessarily mean being judgmental. We're not called to be judgmental. We are called to be a people driven by, guided by, informed by by love. And it makes a tremendous difference when we view the world in that way. So let me leave you with this one and only one thought that I hope you'll carry with you. That we are called to be extraordinary. We are gifted by God to be extraordinary. We are called to bear the good news of Jesus Christ so that when people meet us, they can say, finally, some good news. Now, I would ask one of my traditions in closing, and I know you generally do it early in your service, I like to close a sermon by all of us saying the Lord's Prayer, if that's all right. No need for a vote. I'm just done. Uh, <laughs> but I'd like you to join me in the Lord's Prayer. So let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand for him over five seconds.
Again, thank you for allowing me to share this morning with you. I always enjoy my visits to Hebron. Not that far away. It's a nice break from Winfield. So I'm very happy to be here. And certainly uh, I'm very appreciative of Pastor Pete and all of the good folks at Hebron and all of the good work that you're doing here. So thank you very much. And now it is my distinct privilege to offer a blessing to each one of you. As we go from this place, we call the church to go into the world to be the church. So we pray, may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God, the Creator, communion of the Holy Spirit, be with each one gathered here today. So let us walk from this place to make disciples, to be disciples, and to be instruments of God's grace. In Jesus' name, amen.